welcome to our Citizen Arts podcast series, A More or Less Perfect Union, What Matters Most to Americans as Elections Approach. Hi, I'm Jim Gabe of Citizen Arts. This three-part podcast digs into our fast-evolving political, social, and cultural drama in a truly different way. Here's how. In the category of who knew, 2016 gave us an election that rocketed Trumpist populism and seemed to be a clarion call for magnified political, social, cultural turmoil. Do you remember what mattered most to you before the turmoil magnified? Is it important that you remember? We think you might think so. And so our first episode is a unique journey back to what seems like ancient history, the months leading up to that cyclone of an election. At that time, Citizen Arts interviewed nearly 200 Americans from all walks of life around the U.S., left and right, young and old, rural and cosmopolitan, black, brown, yellow, white, professional, blue collar, and so on. Those interviews became the essence of our educational documentary titled A More or Less Perfect Union. This film has been presented in forums at universities, high schools, libraries, and before civic and culture groups throughout the U.S. and in Europe, China, and India. We're presenting a condensed audio version of A More or Less Perfect Union in this first episode of our pre-election podcast series. You can view a teaser of the actual documentary at www.citizenartscreative.org. Maybe you'll be surprised by what a cross-section of American voters said back then. At the least, we think you'll be touched by their candor, passion, humor, wisdom, dreams, Maybe you'll be inspired by their pride in country, strength of conviction, hopefulness. And maybe you'll be left thinking, as we enter another potentially monumental election cycle, we'd better have some clear ideas about what voting could mean over the coming years. Or even simply, that we'd better vote. And you might also be left wondering where those who spoke out six years ago in a more or less perfect union, are now in their thinking. We at Citizen Arts sure were wondering, so we invited this small representative cross-section of the nearly 200 to a reunion. And so, dear friends, after listening to a more or less perfect union, please carry on to episodes two and three of our podcast series, Compelling Nationwide Discussions, Sometimes Debates Await You expressions of the American soul as our democracy calls us to the ballot box. On behalf of my Citizen Arts colleagues and the extraordinary participants in a more or less perfect union, a heartfelt thanks for lending an ear. We invite you to join the conversation and let us know what you think. And always, please stay healthy in mind and body, wealthy in goodwill, and wise in action. And now, settle back, pop in your ear pods. Here's the audio version of the Citizen Arts documentary, A More or Less Perfect Union. The happy union of these states is a wonder, their constitution a miracle, their example, the hope of liberty throughout the world, so wrote James Madison, father of the Constitution. Why don't you back up? No, I'm not going to back up. I am an immigrant. I can't Let legally. I can't legally. legally. The country is at loggerheads on almost every single issue. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! I don't want people walking around with assault rifles on their backs. Get it out of my face! There's a huge divide. We're becoming two Americas. It's hard to find common ground. Is that what our founding fathers had in mind when they penned the Constitution with the noble goal of creating a more perfect union? 
of giving expression to some of the noblest, most inspiring ideals invented by humankind? If those savvy, gallant patriots saw the state of their perfect union, they might hightail it back to the old country. Can it be our beloved land, inspiration to the world, has lost its way? How is that to be explained? God bless me, my wife, our son, his wife, us four and no more. We gotta get away from that. It is definitely me and my world. There's a sense of entitlement. Just a real focus on the petty and small things in life. Like what? Like an iPhone. Why is everyone always talking about problems? Why can't we talk about the good things? Sometimes to me, it almost seems like we don't want people to get along. The land where Abraham Lincoln prophesied the people were sure to be touched by the better angels of their nature has become mired in the negative, the selfish, how come? They show so much negativity in our news. It just gives the nation a very negative attitude towards everything. Hmm. It's not that we the people have lost our way. It's that the media is telling us we have. The media makes us seem very red or blue and very little purple. We are not as divided as the media would like us to think. Constantly putting divisive tactics out to make us feel like we're on teams. We allow extremism to make us forget that we share a common humanity. The media shapes people's opinion. If you say we're being polarized, don't blame anyone else. Driving extremism? Polarizing us? Why would our media mavens do that? They have an agenda. They're funded commercially. Those places have to see people. There's numbers on a spreadsheet because their money is invested there. There are beer and shampoo ads they need to sell. They hone in on certain issues that scare you or get you mad. I took a news writing class. The definition of news was conflict. If you buy into that definition, then you don't get to see any of the middle ground. The old-fashioned ideas of objective journalism has been turned into advocacy journalism and everybody takes positions. It's not just that. That's an easy scapegoat. It's an easy crutch for people to say, well, it's the media. Everybody has a voice now through technology and social media. I have a certain viewpoint. I tweet something out, I email something out, and lo and behold, I, I have created a forest fire. It's a lot harder to compromise these things. When elected officials are giving information through the news, they've got basically 10 seconds to tell why they differ from their opponent. And if you force people into the short form, they're going to be incendiary. Media loves to pick that up, blow air on it to get the fire going. You listen to someone, you take that as the truth, and now you're on one side of the equation or the other. The media reinforces everybody's opinions. If you're a liberal, you probably don't watch conservative media very much, and if you do, your blood pressure goes up and you're conservative, your blood pressure goes up when you watch the liberal media. In recent years, we have viewed politics like we view sports. Either my team wins, your team wins, the zero-sum game. The powers that be enjoy when we quibble over things. There are certain shiny objects that they absolutely know as soon as they shake them, Everyone will go, oh, yeah, gay marriage. Or they shake the abortion coin and everyone goes, yes or no. Why do they do it? To keep us complacent so we don't all rise up. <laughs> <laughs> rise up? Grab the microphones? What would we say? Would we make our founding fathers proud? Would we discover intriguing things about the kind of people and union we are? America's vastness make it inevitable. We sometimes seem like alien creatures to each other. There are definitely different vibes all over. Uh, Seattle's definitely different. They're incredibly more liberal than we are. California, people were very different. I guess a little more smiley than here, but it felt a little bit fake. 
In Phoenix, there's not one spot people congregate. It's strip malls and suburbs. In St. Cloud, Minnesota. I'm gonna get in big trouble for this. It was like having clothes that don't fit. The way people move, talk, averted their eyes. Gross Point, Michigan, a suburb that borders Detroit. There are a number of walls that have been built between white and black. Is this Cook County? <laughs> Crook County. I am totally taxed down in what we call Crook County. The South is very different, can be kind of segregated. Louisiana. The Southern hospitality is there, but the people aren't as warm. They kind of keep to themselves. The Fouche Parish, is where we're standing, is, was voted the most corrupt <laughs> parish in the state, which makes us the most corrupt piece of land in the United States. <laughs> coon ass that gets thrown out a lot. If you're a coon ass and you call me one, we're okay. But if you're a Yankee and you call me a coon ass, then we're, it's a different story. Alabama. People just walk around with guns the way I walk around with my iPhone. Charlotte, North Carolina. It's all accounting. Washington, D.C. There's not as much room for creativity. That I found it incredibly bureaucratic. Up north, Pittsburgh, I kind of get looked on as that is a color girl or that's a black girl. Philadelphia is a city of brotherly love, but it's still a racially taught city, very segregated. Talk about zingers. Hey, Donnie, have you got one? I would have a problem surviving and socializing in a place like Boston. If it rained, a lot of people would drown because they got their nose stuck up in air. I consider myself a preppy Bostonian. I'm not a New Yorker. I, you won't see me in black. How? <laughs> Where's our preppy pal going with this? New York, I find almost just too much. It sounds like a lot of us think our USA is a mixed bag of strange places, including my hometown. Places we wouldn't spend much time in and might never take the kids, dogs, and cats. This begs the question, why does anybody live in such dicks? Why isn't everybody where we are? This is the reddest part of the country. Close to 99% voted Republican in the presidential election. The free-thinking academic setting, the blue dot in a red state. There are still pockets where we don't want outsiders, people who think differently than we do. Everybody you know is in a sports, either a surfer, a skater. It's just a giant bubble of like-minded people. When you walk out of that bubble, you're hit with the reality of what the rest of the United States is thinking. Maybe everybody isn't where we are because we prefer to hang with people like us. Could it be as simple as that? The PLU syndrome? Why are you where you are? Primarily, it's affordable. I came to pursue an acting career. It's a city that is a fertile place for creative people. These beautiful paintings around us. Are these an expression of your soul? <laughs> I think they are. I like the diversity. I have the opportunity of representing a district that has an even number of Republicans and Democrats. I've got farms, urban centers, cows, BMWs. I find it to be a nice pocket of greater equality and acceptance for many different people. That's the first play that I just show up from Mexico. My family is first from here, so I stay here. This is the metro station. I take it to work, trying to be green, you know, save the world. We're gutsy. We have courage. Damn the torpedoes, full steam ahead. It's a hard-working town. People love to work. The heritage is in my blood. At least 10 generations of watermen ahead of me. It is our mission. We were called here by God to do what we do, to help those people without access to health care. I met the love of my life and my best friend, and this is where she lived. I am so lucky I live here because I love the outdoors, taking a walk, going on a hike. We started the American Revolution. We've always been a progressive state. Gay marriage happened here years ago. The Affordable Care Act was Romney Care before it became Obamacare. We're pretty focused on sports. It's a sports town. Uh, and I don't mean to sound elitist, but there's a lot of really good thinkers in this city. I'm reading a biography of Julius Caesar right now. Because you look like him, right? Yeah, right, yeah. You look more like his horse than you. <laughs> it's bitterly cold environment sometimes, but people's hearts are warm. 
It's a city that is being reborn. It's very attractive to young people. It keeps us young. How about that mountain territory that fired up the growth of our nation? All my sins are taken away, taken away. We have a very unique culture. We could have lived anywhere else and we came back home. This place provides us with a sense of who we are. The people are real and genuine. This is the Bible Belt. They're very strong, prideful people. They are not into taking handouts. Some of the social programs, even though they are the poorest in the country and could use these, they reject them because they have a strong sense of self, a strong work ethic. They're my kind of people. How about the bird that puts us on wheels? A lot of people put Detroit down and say it's a real, real bad city. Just because you see crime on TV, that don't mean everybody in Detroit is like that. You got people in this city. You got people living here in the city. When I graduated from university, I saw just about everyone from my generation leaving the state. I purchased a house in Detroit. There are people that maybe the world outside sees as not having very much. The rich in generosity and old school values. You got gray housing, low rent. This ain't no work here. It's a lot of work here. It's optimism. Everybody's feeling good about the city's coming back. Cutting me some slack. You got a man. in the gray. So glad you passed my way. Sounds like most of us feel pretty good about where we are. For many of the same reasons, everybody else digs their digs. In other words, living in different places in this vast country doesn't automatically make us distinct from each other. So why do we turn each other off? How about you? Can you tell us things about you that'll explain why we can seem like alien creatures to each other? Why we can seem so hopelessly divided? Let's get personal. Jesus, nothing else matters. All I had here is the front of God. That's why we always pray so we have peace of mind, happy life, good living condition, healthy family, a wish, a hope. Other people have the same thing as like me. As for now. But what about spiritual credos that'll explain why we're alien creatures to each other? That'll turn us off. That's what we're looking for. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. I have a belief in a higher power. It lets me know that there's something that I can pray to, that I can ask for strength from. We were grounded in religion. There's a belief system with Christianity, with the Catholic Church, with Judaism. What matters to me most is nurturing and ensuring the future of the eternal covenant that connects God to the Jewish people. I want that connection to God to influence their lives, to make the types of decisions that our world needs. Religion, or at least in my life, teaches me to try to take the best out of people and not judge them. That makes my life happier. You don't have to live in a church, I found out, to be a good person, a good Christian. You show your respect in the religion by what do you do to help one another? Look, look out for the world and the environment. I'm gonna let it shine. We believe in the circle. I see every person in the world of equal value. I'm drawn to the unity of all people and, and to respect all religious backgrounds and cultures. Through meditation and yoga, I've learned a lot in terms of living in the present moment and realizing that you have control of yourself, not of anyone else. And it's not always about you. What matters is patience and kindness. This is where you examine your dislikes for someone, your receptivity to a different way, and then how you practice it outside this dojo, is how well have you actually accepted what you've heard here. Satyagraha is the concept Martin Luther King embraced, the concept of nonviolence. Love for humanity, love for myself. It's a universal vibration. We can change lives. I have been to the bottom of bottoms. I have been homeless. I have had drinking problems. I've learned from every experience, and it's made me the person that I am today. How about life's tough personal experiences? What do we discover about us in them? I don't have my parents. My father passed, and uh, my mom suffers with uh, bipolar depression. I do not live with her, but I live with my aunt, and I had to mature faster than my peers. A few years ago, I began my transition as a transgender woman. I was afraid of being rejected. 
It was exactly the opposite. I was supported and accepted. And that blew my mind and humbled me. I remember getting beat up coming off the bus. I had jab spray painted on my driveway. I always remind myself, it's only a minority of people. I was robbed. I had a gun to my head. Every day you gotta get up and say life is a gift. The day my son was born, it changed my life completely. Every day I wake up, I look in the mirror and I say, what kind of goals am I gonna set to improve myself? Turned out I had stage four esophageal cancer, got given a, a year to live. But I, I kind of thought that there'd be this sort of big bucket list, but actually what became incredibly important were family, friends, and have a pizza and a beer. I got laid off. Before that, I didn't have high regard for people who are on unemployment. Once you walk a mile or two in those shoes, I certainly had a whole new appreciation for how people end up there and how you try to get out of that. When I ran for state representative, I learned that people expect the worst merely by attaching a label, black man, Republican. I pushed back against preconceived notions every day. 9-11 was a big wake-up call. The war came home for America. I realized how vulnerable we are. I feel we, the people, have to take care of each other. One-on-one, -on -one, loving each other. Whom do you look to as a role model for a guiding hand? I think everyone hears their mother's voice in their head about five times a day. My father helped me with believing that I could do things. He said to me, son, when you help people, you've got to help all people. That's why I became the only full-blood legislator in Oklahoma history. My father-in-law, Linwood Holton, was my role model, and he was the first elected Republican governor of Virginia. He decided to embrace the integrated public education and even with his own kids lead the way. It made people really mad and he could never get nominated for another thing by his own party. And now, 35 or 40 years later, people say, now there was a guy who was a great public servant. If it wasn't for my grandfather, I wouldn't have seen six movies a week. You know, and I, I wouldn't have found myself delving into these imaginative lifestyles and wanting to be on the screen. And he was like, yeah, follow your dream. Normally, I don't need any idol. Okay, really, is I think I'm the idol. You're the idol. Correct. But uh, you know, I really learned a lot of from my wife. She gave me a lot of encouragement. I have to say, my brother, because he's sitting right next to me, Jeez, thanks. <laughs> My older brother, he's been on the Chicago Police Department for 30 years. He's straight, he's honest. Be kind to your fellow man. Don't be haters. Mao Zedong. I was growing up with his slogan, 妇女能顶半边天, women can uphold half of the sky. Kevin Durant, his motto is, hard work beats talent, when talent fails to work hard. Cecil Roberts. President of the United Mine Workers. Now he would fight for the working class. I grew up in Puerto Rico, and there were people who fought for Puerto Rican independence, who influenced me. Some died for what they believed in. Most of us wouldn't do that. My first military mentor said, don't give up ever. Always see that the mission is accomplished, whatever that task is assigned to you. W. Edwards Deming taught companies how to continuously improve their products one of his principles is that we should assume that people want to do their best. I believe that. We don't get up in the morning and look in the mirror and say, how can I go to work today and screw the place up? Get up in the morning, look in the mirror. What would be our best? My cat, Bub. One of the most famous animals on the planet. The message came from her fans that said, you know, well, my child has a chronic illness and if it weren't for pictures of Bub, we don't know what we'd do. In my role as a CEO, I hopefully had some positive impact on people's lives. I define leadership as when vision, wisdom, action, and courage intersect. The things that last when gold is gone. I thoroughly enjoyed writing it. Congratulations. Do you know what a fist bump is? Well, I, I never quite get the angle right. Being treated equally as a gay man by the law is the most important thing to be useful at my funeral. If the church is packed with people who genuinely felt like I had made a difference in their lives, that's a life worth living. 
do things for good. Like you help poor people, you help the people that need help, and then my life is so happy with that. When somebody does something nice for you, then the next time you can, do something nice for them. And if everyone would just pay it forward, then we'd come out on time. Talk to people who have different points of view and different opinions because we've all got to get through this together. I want to treat humanity the way I want to be treated. If you live your life with love in your heart, you'll receive that tenfold. My children, that they'll be healthy and happy, and, and yeah, that they'll remember me fondly when they're <laughs> grown up. Maybe have a child. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe get married? Whoa! <laughs> There's the glass ceiling issue, which I would like to dismantle. I would like to coach in the NFL. To win the world title for the uh, best flair bartender. Take underprivileged kids to a ball game, to a night of the opera. My dream is to become a U.S. citizen. Have these personal revelations from your fellow Americans struck you as weird? Alien? Or do we have here the makings of an all-American extravaganza? American. Speaking of which, what does it mean to you to say, I'm an American? Never thought about it. <laughs> I have a sense of witnessing the twilight years of the American empire or the American exceptionalism. A Texan almost invariably says, I'm from Texas. Is that what you say, Texan Helena? I'm actually an English woman, born and raised. Come on, folks. The sun's coming up on a glorious day in the USA. Good morning, America. How are you? It's a beautiful thing, being American. Sit, don't you know me? I'm your native son. That's more like it. When I was in Kosovo, somebody slipped me a note, and in broken English it said, can you help me find a way to give to America? There are some really great values in America that you can stand by. We have the longest surviving constitution in the history of the world. America is an experiment. Really not tried anywhere else before. A nation of laws. We're not necessarily tied by religion or color, creed, race. We're this collection of ideas. Values to stand by. Collection of ideas. What are some we'd put into our American extravaganza? In our best moments, we are living up to that idea of each person having inalienable rights. That is a unique gift America has given the world. Democracy is maybe the most beautiful thing on this planet. I am so thankful for our freedom here. I fly a flag out in front of my house, 24-7, 365. Because we have that freedom, and many people died for that freedom for us. I'm a veteran, I'm allowed to hug you. <laughs> We are an idealistic people writ large, and yet very pragmatic. It's a kind of can-do mentality and a willingness to try anything to get something done. People are given the right to grow into who they want. That's what we are as Americans. That's our beauty. Having lived in other countries, I find that the United States is really a land of endless opportunity. I can own my own recording studio, tour in rock bands that don't make any money, and I have a celebrity pet. When you live in America, you have no excuse to not do something with your life. If you put in your hard day's work, and you keep putting in a hard day's work, this is the best place to have a chance for advancement. We are a great humanitarian nation. We are great in terms of our moral example. Americans are truly compassionate. That is evidenced by our clinic here. Our funding is tied to that compassion. We have over 1,400 volunteers. They work from the heart to give to another. What I like about America a lot is the culture is very focused around families. But you guys keep it all together and you keep in touch. I want you to meet my son and marry him to my family. <laughs> I would love to. Is he employed? I kind of embody what America is about, diversity, and being your own self, embracing who you are. When I first arrived in the U.S., I was in awe of how friendly everyone was. That really opened up my horizon and allowed me to flourish. The United States is a patriotic country that rallies in adverse times. The reverence for life. Every single life counts. 
I think we're becoming a more tolerant nation. Well, we've come from a past where intolerance was a real problem. One of the things I love is the melting pot idea. There's a real blend of cultures. Anybody can come here and suddenly they're an American. We need fill in one country and one family, you know. I chose America because it's really a country of immigrants, open-mindedness. American people are very respectful. I hope I could stay here. I love this country too much to leave. If you love the ideals of what America stands for, then you, you're an American. That it's not the best place it could be, but it's the best place it's been ever. I think of the United States as trying to strive for its ideals, but struggling. That's why we call them ideals. Not the best it could be, struggling to live our ideals. Joe, do you feel that way? I would like to feel that I am an American in the same way that a white guy does. It hasn't always been that great country to me. I've been mad at it sometimes because of how I was treated and people like me are treated. The racism climate does not please me in the least, but I would never denounce being an American. I'm proud of that. I just think we are a country that could do a lot better. What I deal with on a daily basis is what I call microaggressions, particularly from white people, sometimes even black people, there's a certain assumption that I may be dangerous or threatening. I feel less safe in my own community. I feel much more policed. I'm proud that we're a melting pot. I wish we'd melt a little faster, a little more joyfully. I'd like everybody to expect the best from each other. What's developed in our society is a profound lack of trust in our neighbors. To be an American is to be imperfect and recognize that, but know that you have the opportunity to make change. Make change. What do you think of that, Jen? I just want someone like you and I to come in and run this country. You and me on Capitol Hill? Oh, you must be kidding. The people that are apathetic, don't get engaged, they really piss me off. We have it so great, and all we do is complain about the things that aren't perfect. I'm not complaining. I just don't think I can run things. But I do think we should drop in on our Washington leaders. Tell them about our hopes and dreams. Sound good? I don't think it would have much value. No? Absolutely not. Absolutely not? Absolutely not. How come? They don't view themselves as working for me. The power system thinks mainstream America is unintelligent and uninformed. Is that what you think our Washington leaders think? There are those who are genuinely interested in what their constituents think, but politicians don't move on anything unless they feel it might benefit them politically. If I were to ask them for something, it would mean nothing if I didn't have a little bit of green behind it. Special interest groups were able to take politics and turn it into a business. The amount of money that is involved is insane. Big money prevents small people from rising to the top. There was a time when I was going to run for Congress. I was told over and over again, if you don't have money, you're not going to be elected. We don't have states money. I go back to our founding fathers. They had their issues too, but uh, sometimes you just have to rise above and take one for the team. They're scared. If they try to go against their party, they could lose their job. They're afraid to take that risk. The professional politician is not what our founders had in mind. We go for an altruistic reason, to go serve our country and let someone else come in with fresh ideas. Do you solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution? United it's very States ironic. If the people in Washington could look at the example set by the guy their city is named after, we are creating an oligarchy. It's the same people all the time. The politically elite are disengaged from most of the nation. They have no idea what people are facing. The majority are upper middle class white men and their experience, interaction, and interests are profoundly different than a woman or a person of color, an immigrant. I don't feel they're able to relate to the majority of us. They're all bullshitters. 
Democrats, Republicans. We, the taxpayers, do our job, and yet they don't get nothing done. Just throw them all out. Okay, we throw them out. Then what? It really comes down to us reawakening a citizen's role in shaking the tree. But how are we going to shake the tree, get the eagle soaring, so anybody notices? I'm stumped. What are we going to do? We'll give ourselves superpowers. The snap of a finger. We will change anything in our towns, the USA, the world, the universe, because we are the people. Hey, Evangelista, how about we put you in the Oval Office? What would you change with your superpowers? I don't try to change nothing. What do you want to change? Okay, maybe Evangelista is vice president. Hello! We have a snazzy desk for you in the Oval Office. Are you sure you want to have a Puerto Rican as president? A gay Puerto Rican? Let's see a show of hands for Jesus. How about you? We put you on Capitol Hill. No. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> no. No me. No. <laughs> No. <laughs> Me, no. I have a scandalous background. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> I'm a good character actor, but not that good. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> oh, so I get my Wonder Woman bracelets. <laughs> How can I handle it? We can do it. We're the power team and we've got God. We'll be praying. Okay. I will volunteer. I would like to sit next to the Speaker of the House. Ah! All right. That's what I'm talking about. Girl power. Hi, Diane. What if we put you in charge? I would love to be in the Oval Office. How about the rest of us? Would we use our Capitol Hill superpower? And if so, what would we do first? I like the mountains. I like to hunt. I like to fish. I love the Second Amendment. I enjoy and with privilege and pride wear a sidearm wherever I can. I challenge anybody that likes to challenge me about that. I'm not trying to take anybody's hand weapon away that they think is protecting them from whatever. I was selling lobsters. A guy came up and uh, showed a knife and asked me to empty my cash drawer that I had. I don't get asked that anymore. I can't stand it when I hear somebody walked into a movie theater or walked into a school and killed dozens of people because they were angry or mentally ill. Fight by poverty. There's great wealth in this country, but there is areas that are plagued with poverty. People come into this clinic and they're asking us for food. The reason why they're poor is they make poor decisions. As long as we support them, those decisions have no consequences. I don't know how, but I changed the way it is done so that they have to face some consequences. What they need is a ladder. Educational programs, drug abuse programs, counseling, job training. Give a man a fish, you feed him for one day. Teach him how to fish, you feed him for the rest of his life. I would completely obliterate all of the old health care processes and make it universal health care. We've got people that worked 30, 40 years for a company that promised them health care till the day they die. They're taking their health care away from them. It scares me for my future, my kids, my grandkids' future. We need to do more for all their working class. Take the money out of politics. Make a more representative democracy in which the people are making more decisions than the moneyed interests figure out something on the taxes. There's the big corporates, they're supposed to be getting all these breaks. The little guy gets taxed to death. Change affirmative action to being a program that aided people under a certain socioeconomic level. Switch the race out of it. There are white kids that need affirmative action, and it stigmatizes blacks. Amnesty to all of my foreign national friends have the right to stay and live. Energy infrastructure. Work towards more sustainable energy. Eliminate religious fanaticism. Every religion have terrible fanatics. They are the destruction. What do you think are we the people's top three superpower priorities? 
Priority three of We the People bring world peace. It has to begin with me saying you're a human being. If humankind had respect for each other, other things would change. The dignity of the human person fosters this sense of commonality, of ownership of each other's problems. I would say to the whole world, you are now able to deal with empathy, consideration, negotiation, most importantly, listening. Let it change what you do. Stop those hateful acts and come together as one. I don't think we can do anything without each other. If that doesn't happen, we're screwed. People of all the world are brothers and sisters. Priority two of We the People, economic opportunity for everybody. With the closure of factories, how do you sustain middle class life? It's representative of small towns around the country. It drives me insane that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. I watch my father works harder and harder for less money. I grew up upper middle class. I started on second base, and there's a lot of other people who are having a hard time just getting up to bat. I'd like to see the everyday common man earn a, a livable wage. He can take some pride in. How do we open the door to economic opportunity for all? Make sure government works for everyone, not just those who write the biggest checks. People who can't write the big checks have got to organize to deal with the complicated issues of income inequality. They equally distribute all the wealth in the world. Manifest a socialist agenda. Take care of the poor people, but still encourage capitalism, reward capitalism. If we can get back to that, it would be good for the country. Being more self-sufficient. If you need to find a job, you might consider you having to move. So what? You got to get off your ass and go work. Help get the job, go to work, better yourself. It's just not possible for me to see leadership make the kind of changes that they need to make for future generations. There's so much crap that has to be dealt with and it's not being done effectively now. Sometimes you got to blow the thing up and start over. Hey Seuss, what is Joy getting at? Our education system sucks. I would make it the best in the world. Priority one of We the People by a landslide. Make our education best in the world. It's really about making sure that people have the same access to high quality education, whether you're inner city school or private school. The poorest kid or the richest kid should receive the same education. They should be able to go to any college but not have the guilt of taking everything that your parents have worked for and putting them in hardship. Teachers and educators in this country should be paid a lot more than what they're getting paid right now. Why would somebody that's gifted and could teach that to kids settle for a $25,000 a year job? We need an effort nationally to emphasize civic learning, the principles of justice and rule of law and capitalism and human rights and freedom. If we don't do this, the principles that have made us successful will be lost. The quality education is what's going to separate us from the rest. There's a lot of lip service about it. We should not fall so low amongst industrialized nations. We're just so far behind. Shame on us. Maybe I have to rely more heavily on India, China, and other countries to support what we are doing here technology-wise. Bulletin, China's $250 billion annual investment in education paying off. Shanghai team's shock education world score first in reading, math, science on respected international test. U.S. 17th in reading, 23rd in science, 31st in math. We used to be first in the percentage of adults that would get college degrees. Now we're about 15th in the world. We're still top of the world in the percentage of people that start college, that folks don't finish. Affordability is more and more of a challenge. To me, it's the top domestic priority. It will help our economy go better. It will help people get better jobs. For us to be a superpower, we need to be a superpower at home first. Superpower at home. Hmm. Where do we turn in real life to find real superpower? 
to step up our game. Of course! Let's go! We citizens have an obligation equal to those who may present themselves for public office. We have to seek out the best people and encourage them to be leaders, to be public servants. That's what Americans have always done, stepped up, found great leaders at moments of great challenge. Come out here in the last second, and I gotta try to figure out how- A lot of Americans, because they're so frustrated about politics, I am tired of it. They don't want to talk about it. The news out of the nation's capital is often cryptic, and the relevance to daily life is not often explained. People get a distorted and incomplete or an inaccurate view. Young people particularly aren't understanding the founding concepts that made our country great. I definitely hear a lot that I would describe as ignorant. It takes a lot of work to really understand what's going on and not just blindly accept what friends or the news or an entertainment source has told you. Maybe it's laziness a sense of I don't really care to know because it doesn't affect me. The youth in general should be voting more. There's so many people that complain about whoever's in office, but they don't do anything to change it. They don't use their vote. I'm a judge of elections. I supervise a polling place. We were proud that we had 27% of the electorate come out in the last primary election, because it was better than their average. When you see the number of people that sit on the sidelines, in a presidential election, a senatorial election, a gubernatorial election, to say, you know what, these guys are all bums. They're all bums because you did not engage. People, when they don't vote, when they don't go and exercise that freedom, they're already saying, I've given up, I don't care, it doesn't help me. Well, you're not involved in the process. Sometimes when people criticize our system, I almost feel like it's sort of to give them an excuse not to be involved. I and mean, if voters will say, well, I'm not voting because I think politics is bad. Cynicism and apathy are poisonous for our system. I meet people all the time who tell me they think Congress is broken because of gerrymandering, campaign finance problems, hyper-partisanship, and really needs people committed to fixing it. There's some truth to that. We have the ability to participate here, and since so many people all around the world wish they did, the least we can do is take advantage of that opportunity. But, but is it possible for the average Jane or Joe to make a difference? I ran as a nobody. You can win. I'm living proof of it. Americans can move mountains. They can change the system. They just have to engage in it. The most important lobbyist in this city is the constituent. The Lincoln idea that we have a government that is by the people, of the people, and it is for the people, is still true. It only works if people take it seriously. It's people should reach out to those of us who serve and tell us what you think. You can control the operation of our government under our Constitution. You're the boss. Who's the boss? The people. The people. The people. Me. 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 Okay. We are the boss. Let's tell them what we think. You're in your little bubble of politics, of getting reelected. You're so polarized that you guys can't work together. Stop ending up with right-wing and left-wing politics. End up with the politics of the country. It's not about personal gain or moving up the ladder. It's about being for the people. If you're not going to be for the people, you need to step out. I want you to work towards equal opportunity for everyone in America, not just the people that you feel will personally help you. Focus on the, the, the bulk of the country and not just the 1%. Look at the lower class people who need help, who broke their backs putting this country where it was. Come down there, where we are, you know, all the small people, so you guys can understand when you make a decision, how much can affect or how much can benefit people. Can you represent everybody? Can you find a way to make life in America this wonderful thing for everybody. You really look for the best interests of not just the people that look like you or act like you or think like you or believe in the things that you believe in, 
but your opposites. Look at what you are supposed to be, a public servant. When you were a little boy or a little girl, you grew up and said you wanted to be in public service, this is public service. Figure it out. That means you have to quit this quibbling and bickering and petty grade school squabbling. Let's focus more on how to get there and less on trying to pin people as hating one segment of society or preferring a different segment. We want a secure country and health care and education. And your job is to figure out how do we get to those goals. Issues like immigration and minimum wage and regulation. You guys have got to come together and find some common ground and move this country forward. You remember that you're our brothers, you're our uncles, our aunts, our moms. Remember that we desperately are concerned about affordability, having a prosperous, safe, happy life. Everyone has a different voice and some people speak louder than others. Give everyone an equal chance to voice what they want to say. We have so many great things about our nation and our culture that we should be celebrating inspire me. To come visit me in my world just so we can all have an understanding and you can go back to your goals that you set out to do to change America. I am America and you work for me. Come see me and let's try to change this world together. Man up. That's it. That's all I got. Command our respect as citizens. And if you do, our country will prosper. And the people who elect you will be behind you 100%. Be stewards of the American future. Communicate with one another. Whether you're from a blue state or a red state, black or white, male or female, come together and communicate. Work to get the solutions and don't go home until you do. God bless America. We must all hang together, or assuredly, we shall all hang separately. So said Benjamin Franklin at the signing of the Declaration of Independence. This has been a Citizen Arts presentation of a Gay Group Productions documentary, All Rights Reserved.